Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. Dave Cook is a historian. He's an author. He's a community man. He's someone that I bump into at one of my favorite uh, breakfast places on a fairly frequent basis in uh, downtown Cooksville. Uh, Dave Cook lives in Applewood Acres in Mississauga. In the late 1940s, Dave's father purchased farmland in Malton. Unfortunately, his family's plans were... uh, were ruined when uh, they wanted to establish a chicken farm, but the federal government expropriated the land to uh, expand what is now Pearson Airport. The family moved to Applewood Acres in the 1950s, uh, and Dave became interested in motorsport and eventually became a track announcer at the major automobile races in Ontario, New York, Ohio, and Michigan. That sounds like a fascinating uh, career. During this time, at Johnny Lombardi's uh, Chin Radio uh, in Toronto, he was an on-air announcer. He uh, also accepted a job as a sports reporter for Inland Publishing, assigned to the Mississauga News. He went on to cover Mississauga Council, where he quickly developed a desire for local politics, ran for council, and was elected in 1980 when he served for three different terms. We're going to go on and talk a little bit more about uh, the balance of uh, his bio in a couple of minutes. But I thought it would be great to have Dave Cook on because he's got an immense knowledge about the history of, uh, of Mississauga. Uh, and he uh, he's written a couple books about that. Dave, tell me about the books that you've written, please. Okay, Brian. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for um, having me today. I'm uh, uh, as you as you mentioned, I'm an author. I've written actually four books, and I've I've got copies of them here. The first book I wrote, uh, I don't know whether you can see that. Yep. Okay, that book is the history of Applewood Acres, where I live. And the interesting thing about Applewood Acres is that it was built by the Ship family, Gordon Ship and Harold Ship. And um, it was the largest subdivision built, and I believe even to this day, in North America by a what they call a a single family developer. Uh, No other uh, developers came in. Harold and Gordon built 800 homes. And a lot of people lived here. In fact, in the 1960s, (laughs) my uh, neighbor just up the road from me, was Colonel Harlan Sanders. Oh, really? Yes, and he lived here for four months of every year for 20 years. When he would come to Canada to promote his KFC company in Canada, uh, his wife hated motels, so they bought a house, and it was in Applewood Acres, so that was kind of interesting, you know. Colonel Sanders lived up the street from you. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and I actually got to see him and meet him, and uh, he went to our local church. I I have his autograph in the church book. They were they they were cleaning stuff out, and they threw it out, and I said, "Don't throw that out." <laughs> so, uh, anyway, and the second did he take book, you to a KFC for a dinner? No, he didn't. He never <laughs> took you to a KFC for a dinner. That's terrible of him. Well, I was just a kid at the time. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was in my what twenties or so. Uh, But then the second book I wrote, um, the first book, by the way, became a bestseller in terms of numbers, over 5,000 sold. And then the second book was the history of a hockey arena called the Dixie Arena and the Dixie Beehive hockey team. And it's it's fascinating. The Dixie Arena no longer exists, but the Dixie Beehive was sponsored by St. Lawrence Starch, the um, Dixie Beehive, Beehive Corn Syrup. And they put 49 players into the NHL right here in Mississauga. And uh, that book became uh, very popular. And uh, June of this year. Where was the Dixie? Where was the Dixie Arena? Okay, if if you know, on the Dundas, just west of Dixie Road on Dundas, uh, there's a Canadian tire store. Well, on the north side of Dundas, directly opposite, was where the arena was. So it was very, very close to, uh, to where I live. And um, the interesting thing about the Dixie Arena is that in June 15th of this year, the Pallet family, which was one of the major developers of the arena back in the the late 40s, um, Keith Pallet is organizing a reunion. And he told me he's already got 500 people on their uh, computer uh, website or whatever it is, uh, Facebook, 500 people saying they will be there. So it's going to be an incredible, incredible reunion. Tell so, me, uh, if you could, uh, one or two of the NHL players that came from there. Um, Brendan Shanahan was the very last player from the Beehives. And uh, there was a list of 49. I've got them here. Uh, but I know Brendan Shanahan was uh, the last one. 
Um, other names uh, that I don't know whether you, I know them, but uh, Brett McDonald, uh, Bill McDougal, Dave McLean, uh, Mike San, Craig Muni, Randy Cunningworth, uh, Mike Donnelly. Um, That's a great history. Thank you so much for sharing that oh, with us. It, it really, the, the, the history of Dixie Arena and the Dixie Beehives, it touched everybody who lived in Cooksville area, Mississauga at the time. Every Friday night, the arena was packed with public skaters. And then on the weekend, they'd have the hockey. Now, the Junior A team of the Dixie Beehives went on to uh, to win several titles in Ontario. So it was quite a popular uh, arena and team. So I was quite happy. The third book I wrote was called Fading History, Volume 1. And it's a series of 40, uh, 15 different stories. And um, I write about the Avro Arrow, which was made here in Mississauga. Prior to that, during World War II, the... Um, the Lancaster bomber was made here, where Pearson really? Airport is. Oh, yep, I didn't know yep. that. We, well, of the eight thousand Lancasters that were made worldwide, we made over four hundred of them here in Mississauga during World War II. Which and was after, the main bomber during World War II, was it not? Exactly, it was. It, it was the bomber, and um, there's only one left in Canada that flies, and it's out in Hamilton, and that aircraft was made made here. And uh, it's just incredible. Tell so, us, if you could, a little bit about the history of the Avro Arrow. Well, okay, the Avro Arrow, my brother, by the way, was one of the uh, engineer technicians. And um, <laughs> every time it took off, it flew over my dad's farm house. <laughs> but uh, the Avro Arrow uh, was the most fascinating aircraft ever built. Just picture, uh, here we are 60 years ago with an aircraft that today would its its performance would rank it in the top 10 of all aircraft in the world and this is 60 years ago because of what speed or when you say performance what do you what are you using speed? as a criteria well just to sort of a, to to explain it this way if you can imagine the top speed of any aircraft in the world was was Mach 1 the speed of sound this thing could do double that I mean, it, it was incredible. This thing would fly at 1,700 kilometers an hour. You know, it was just it, just incredible aircraft. When the layoff came, what happened was, and this is, there's so many different myths about why the arrow was uh, stopped. Um, but if you do the research and you start to put it all together, you realize a couple of things very, very obvious. Uh, for instance, in the Toronto Star, um, 60 years ago, just before the Arrow was cancelled, before Diefen Baker cancelled the Arrow, the headline story in the Toronto Star was future of Arrow in doubt due to cost overruns. And the story went on to explain that the budget that the government had agreed to to develop the Arrow had hit one-seventh of the total Canadian government's budget. One-seventh. Prime Minister Saint Laurent had made a deal with the company to build the Avro, uh, with the English company, that they didn't at the time have any idea of, of or any consideration of selling the aircraft to anybody. It was strictly for the RCAF for us. And the deal that, that Prime Minister Saint Laurent had made apparently was the company's profit would be 10% of the budget. How does a company make more money? You increase the budget. And apparently, what what the uh, research I, I did indicated that Crawford Gordon Jr., the president of A.V. Rowe at the time, had increased the budget 10 times every year what they needed. So all of a sudden, we have a budget that is bankrupting the country or about to. And at election time, Prime Minister, the future Prime Minister Diefenbaker had challenged Saint Laurent on the cost how are we going to get our money back? And apparently, Prime Minister Saint Laurent had developed a committee that secretly toured the world to see who would be interested in buying it. And the indication came back from virtually every country except one that they were not interested because they felt at the time the future of defense would be missiles, not aircraft. So they were more interested in buying missiles. The Americans, on the other hand, loved the technology and they wanted to buy it. And they they came up and when Diefenbaker was elected, they came up to Canada 
They'd already been here doing a flying saucer, by the way. If you see on the book, they were producing a flying saucer that's now in the Smithsonian Institute. And it was produced in Malton by the Americans because the Canadian government stopped doing it because it, was, it wasn't working. But the Americans wanted to take the arrow. And Prime Minister Diefenbaker said, well, if you take the arrow, that means we lose all of our employees. So they all go south. And the Americans said, so? And Diefenbaker said, I can't, I can't handle that. So Diefenbaker canned the program, hoping, of course, that the engineers that were involved would stay in Canada. Well, they didn't. My brother is an example, an engineer technician. He went to Garrett Air Research in Phoenix. Other engineers is an example, a port credit man, John Sanford. He ended up going down to Rockwell in the States and ended up heading up the program and designed the space shuttle. And then... Uh, John, when he wanted to retire, he wanted to come back home, and he came back home to Canada, and the company, Rockwell at that time, owned a company called Canadian Admiral, which was a firm, uh, uh, they, they made, uh, you know, kitchen stuff and that, uh, uh, stoves and, and refrigerators and so forth. So John Sanford took over that company for a little while, and that, at that time, I was a reporter for the Mississauga News. And I got to tell you, that was the most amazing story I've ever written because I was assigned by my editor to do a business story on a local company. And I picked Canadian Admiral. I went down, met the president, John Sanford. I'm sitting in his office and Brian, I'm looking at a, at a, at a painting, a diagram or a print of two aircrafts separating from one another. And I said to him, what is that? And he said, oh, interesting that you asked. That's the space shuttle. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, the world will find out Friday. Now, this was on a, on a Monday. He said, I'm going back to the States to uh, attend the first test separation of the space shuttle, which I designed to see how it's going to work. And so I was the first reporter that I know of in North America to write the story. What so a great that, experience. Oh, it was it was incredible, you know. And John Sanford went back to the States, attended the, the uh, ceremony and watched it separate, came back up and, uh, and about a year or so later, finally retired. And then he went on to something else. And I don't know where he is now, but that was, to me, that was my most amazing story, you know, and, and I just loved it. I'll never forget it. You know? so, what an amazing story. We're going to have to take a break, though, for some messages uh, and come I back know. in two minutes with uh, Dave Cook, historian, author, uh, Man About Town in Mississauga. We're going to take a break and be back in two minutes with Dave Cook. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're in Saga 960. I wanted to uh, check in with Dave Cook uh, tonight because he is a, a historian, an author, someone who's been involved in politics and uh, in Mississauga and lots of other activities in Mississauga for a long period of time. And And given what you know, what's going on right now uh, in Mississauga, I thought it'd be really helpful to get sort of historical context to what's going on. Uh, I run into Dave on a frequent basis at a local uh, breakfast spot that I love um, and uh, and love to hear love to hear his stories about what's going on. Uh, Dave, we were just reviewing a couple of the books uh, that you've uh, 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 written. The first one was about Applewood uh, Acres, where you live. The second one was about uh, uh, the Dixie Arena uh, and the reunion is coming up uh, this year, you said. And the third was about the Avro arrow primarily let me ask you about the avro arrow do you think it was a mistake for defen baker to cancel it or was it a mistake for uh louis prime minister louis saint laurent to uh to structure the contract uh, with the 10 percent uh, profit that you talked about in my opinion yes that's that's what it was i i believe that had saint laurent done it the way we would have done it today um that aircraft would have been you know would have been nominal we we would have continued the development and it would have been supplied to all the friendly countries you know i really believe that it's a real shame because if you're right that uh, it was flying at mach 2 and it was even today one of the top 10 performance airport airplanes we should have it we need it i know i know everyone was destroyed when they uh, when deep baker um, uh, killed the program uh, they hired a Hamilton company to come out to Malton, and they and I have a picture somewhere in one of one of my uh, files uh, of all five of the aircraft that had been done, and they were disassembled and, and bits and pieces went to the garbage and dumped and so forth. 
And it seems everybody I bump into nowadays has something about the Avro Arrow. Like I have in one of my books, I have a little, um, what, what do you call those little metal tags that says Avro Arrow serial number, you know. So uh, people have all sorts of stuff, you know, it's, it's phenomenal. What was your fourth book, sir? Pardon? Your fourth book. Well, the fourth book, uh, another um, series of stories, and, and in this one, I do write about John Sanford, um, and there's a picture of the the flying saucer being separated from the aircraft on the, the space shuttle. The, the space shuttle, yeah. Flying saucer, sorry, <laughs> the space shuttle. Um, there's other stories in here, the development of, of airports. A lot of people don't know this, but Mississauga, as we call it today, uh, when we go back to the early 1900s, at the foot of Dixie Road in what is now Mississauga, there's a, um, at one time there were four smokestacks. <clears throat> and uh, prior to that, those, that area where the four smokestacks were was the very first airport developed in Canada. And it was developed by a guy named J.A.D. McCurdy and his partner, Alexander Graham Bell. And they developed an airport and taught pilots to fly for the First World War. Then as time went on, um, the development of Pearson Airport took place. And um, that, that, that's just a fascinating story about Pearson Airport, of everything that's happened up there. You know, it's just incredible. But, you know, we had the very first airport in Canada, and uh, it was at the foot of Dixie Road. Other stories in this book, I love to tell it this way. When a young lady was born, her father controlled Europe, one of the Romanovs. Alexander, the Tsar of Russia, his daughter, Olga, ended up, when she became a senior citizen, living in Cooksville. And her granddaughter lived with her and went to T.L. Kennedy School. And a lot of people didn't really understand who she was or believe that she was somebody that important until one day the press came out and surrounded her little house on Camilla Road because she was being taken down to Toronto to have lunch on board the Royal Yacht Britannica with her cousin, Queen Elizabeth II. And at that point, people said, wow, she is who she is. So that was Olga Romanov. Uh, she married a General Kuvelklosky. So, uh, you know, so I've got that story in here. It's just fascinating. OK, so so, you know, in, in the movie, in the TV, television series, The Crown, there was this whole description about how the Queen was trying to connect up with her her. Um, relatives in uh, in Russia um or formerly from Russia the Romanov so what was her connection to the to the the family of the Tsar this is a cousin of the family of the Tsar it, she would have been, I guess a cousin now her um Olga Romanov's well Alexander the Tsar of Russia married Princess Dagmar of Denmark and and at that era all of the royal families of all the countries were all related so i believe that uh, how it would work is is that olga was a cousin to king george i think king george the 6th i think it was so being a cousin they're of course all related as they go down down the line so so it would have been a cousin and uh, are there any romanovs still living in mississauga not in mississauga um, the, the granddaughter who I knew, uh, who went to T.L. Kennedy, dated a good friend of mine. Uh, she went back to Denmark and, um, uh, I believe that she's still alive. I believe she's still there. I haven't, I haven't been in touch with her, but, uh, so, so there, would, would, would she be the, the next in line for the, the, the throne in Russia, if there was ever a reinstation of, uh, the, the monarchy in Russia? Well, good question, because I, I guess she would have been the... She'd be the only living one now. So she would be. Unbelievable. That's a great story. Okay, fantastic. Tell me some more. Tell me some more. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I've actually been, um, this is going to sound <laughs> ridiculous. I've actually been in <laughs> uh, Romanov's bedroom. <laughs> Seriously. I went to Finland for my son's wedding. He married a Finnish lady. And I did a tour of Northern Finland and we went to a little place. Um, I can't remember the name of the little town, but that's where Alexander the Tsar of Russia had his cottage. And that cottage, he used to go fishing in the summertime. That cottage in Finland was where he lived in the summertime. And now it's a museum. And I ended up going through the museum and I walked through every, every you know, room and so forth. And I was telling the curator of the museum that I've got a book on on uh, the Romanov uh, on Olga, 
And uh, so they ended, up, they ended up getting one from me. But, um, you know, <laughs> he said, you're now standing in the bedroom of, of Alexander the Tsar of Russia. So I don't know whether that's, that's sort of a funny little story. <laughs> so tell me some more. Well, other stories in the book. Um, the only non Mississauga story, and I, I have to tell you this one about Gordon Sinclair. He is from Etobicoke. Uh, we'll forgive him for that. But Gordon Sinclair, when I was at Chin Radio in Toronto, I used to, I didn't get to know Gordon, but I used to bump into him at different events that we would be at. And when I was writing the book, you know, it, it hit me. Gordon Sinclair did something that nobody knew. And it was phenomenal in my mind. So I got a hold of the CFRB executive that headed up the company at the time. He lived in Oakville and he was Gordon's boss. And he told me the whole story. One of Gordon's Sinclair's uh, 12 noon commentary that everybody around here would stop and listen to at 12 noon. One of them defended the Americans when everybody was sort of down on them. And that commentary on CFRB radio by Gordon Sinclair was read into the U.S. congressional record. It was then set to a musical background by the artist Tex Ritter. And Gordon's royalties on that recording amounted to over a million dollars. And he turned all the money over to the American Red Cross and pulled them out of bankruptcy. And I thought, that story has to be told. So I, I wrote about that. So give us some context. Uh, what year was this? Why were the Americans in such a disfavor at the time? And what did Gordon Sinclair say? Well, um, okay, this would have been in 1973. Okay. Um, uh, Lyman Potts, who was the director at CFRB, and, and I've got this story here, uh, it, it just basically talks about, um, um, okay, here it is here. Uh, he Okay, he turned the radio on, twisted the dial, turned it on, blah, blah, okay. Um, the Amer okay. The radio, the Americans were taking a verbal beating from nations around the world, disgusted with what he saw and heard. Gordon was outraged. And he then did the commentary defending the Americans. But it was at a time when, when the, the world was sort of down on the Americans. Was this, this would have been, uh, I guess, still during the Vietnam War, um, uh, 73. I guess Nixon was still the president, uh, hadn't resigned by that time. I would imagine, that's right. I would imagine, yeah. Um, yeah, so 1973 was, was the date, you know, so interesting, you know. Um, other stories, uh, well, there's a variety of different stories, and it's all Mississauga. Um, President, uh, <laughs> President Roosevelt, um, when President, when the Americans decided to go into World War II, prior to that, President Roosevelt, um, he used to go up to Manitoulin Island he, he had a little, um, he loved it up there, a little cottage up there. And prior to the Quebec conference, President Roosevelt decided to go up to Manitoulin Island with the war cabinet and discuss what they were going to do at the Quebec conference the next week. And um, I've got the story about his trip through from Hyde Park, New York, right up through uh, Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga, Toronto, and up to Manitoulin. Every inch of rail track was walked by by the all of the groups, the CP, the C, CNR, and all that. Every all the employees walked every inch of track from the states up to Manitoulin to make sure everything was in in order and there'd be no problems. And he got up there to Manitoulin Island, spent a week there. They all decided then that, that uh, the next week at the Quebec conference they would then enter World War II. So that I've got that story in here with some pictures that uh, um, Gordon Sink, um, not Gordon Sinclair, but President Roosevelt's uh, museum sent me. So that's that's amazing. I I had uh, heard stories about his submarine in uh, Nova Scotia, I believe, and that's where he actually uh, caught polio at one point in time. But I never knew that he had a place in Manitoulin Island. Yeah, I've got a picture of it in here and everything, and it was really interesting, you know. So. What a fascinating uh, series of stories that you've got in these two books about fading history. I really appreciate it. And then you went on uh, to a career in politics, both uh, yeah. uh, back in the 70s, I believe, and then uh, just a couple of years ago. And so we got to take a break and come back and talk a little bit about that and uh, what that was like being involved in in politics and 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 why you came back in, uh, in 2018 to serve all over again. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in two minutes with Dave Cook, historian, author, 
and a man that knows a lot about what's going on and has gone on in Mississauga. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting about uh, the history of Mississauga tonight with uh, historian, author, uh, and politician, and sports writer, and uh, and motocross, uh, motorsport announcer, uh, chin radio host, etc., uh, Dave Cook, uh, who uh, lives in Applewood Acres in Mississauga. Uh, he, uh, he was, as we talked about, a uh, motorsport um, announcer, track announcer uh, in Ontario, but also New York. Ohio and Michigan. Uh, he was hired to be an on-air announcer on Chin Radio, uh, and then uh, Chin Radio in the United in in Toronto. He accepted a job uh, with Inland Publishing, assigned to the Mississauga News as a sports reporter, and then he ran for city council in Mississauga and was elected in 1980. He served three terms, and then in 1980, in 2018, he rejoined Mississauga City Council. Um, when uh, Jim Tovey, a former uh, ward councillor, passed away, regrettably, um, he uh, he was appointed to complete out the term. He now sits as a citizen member in the Mississauga Heritage Committee and is also an executive member of the Cooksville Business Improvement Association, the Cooksville BIA. So, Dave, let's go back to 1980. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tell well, me about both covering politics as a reporter before that and then becoming a city councillor during that time period. What was it like? Obviously, it, Hazel McCallion, I think, was the mayor, was she not? At that time, she was. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the uh, 19, um, basically, let's go back to, to the establishment of, of Mississauga. In 1973, uh, the town of Mississauga, uh, they decided to establish it as a city. And, and bring in into the, the city would be Port Credit and uh, Malton and Streetsville and, you know, that area. So... Uh, in 1974, it was officially established as a city, and I was a reporter covering the whole thing at the time. And uh, the first mayor was Dr. Martin Dobkin, and he was elected first mayor of, of the city of Mississauga. Two-year term at that time, and then the second mayor came along uh, in 1974 um, after the two years, and uh, was um, uh, Ron Searle. Uh, Ron has passed away. Martin is still around, but Ron Searle became the mayor for two years, and then Hazel came in and in, uh, in defeated uh, Ron Searle. And then, of course, Hazel sat for all those years. Um, I... Hazel was against the uh, amalgamation uh, of the city of Mississauga, was she not? She was the mayor of Streetsville, I think. As far as I, I remember, she was a little bit upset about it. She thought Streetsville should remain as it is. Um, because I, I believe at that time she was the mayor of Streetsville. Yep. And uh, her her husband, Sam, was the uh, owner and editor of the local newspaper up there. So she had a lot of um, a lot of concern about Streetsville, you know, becoming just part of a big city. Um, as it turned out, she ended up um, having to accept it. And uh, she became a counselor and, and uh, was elected on council. And then eventually mayor. Um, what happened with me was um, as a reporter covering um, sports originally, then they they put me into the business section and then into the political section. And I was attending council meetings and uh, Hazel at the time was the mayor. And I was very, very interested in in what was happening and a little bit upset at times. At the time, I was the president of the Applewood Acres Homeowners Association. And we had some problems here. And uh, uh, the executive said to me, why don't you run for council? Because the local councillor is not doing what we want him to do. And I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I ran and won. And I sat for three terms and I retired in 1988. The first term was two years, and then the second and third were three-year terms. And then after I retired, they went to four-year terms, which is what they have now. But um, sadly, Jim Tovey died in, in 2018, exactly 30 years after I retired. The city council contacted me and said, would you run for the nomination to replace Jim Tovey. There was 19 people in all that ran for that nomination. 
And I knew from the conversation I had with one of the counselors that called me that I had five counselors supporting me. I needed six to win. And the, <laughs> the irony here is that in 1980, I defeated Ron Starr. He was the counselor. Ron later on in many years got reelected back and Ron Starr was the deciding vote in 2018 to appoint me as the interim member. So kind of kind of interesting there. I, I didn't realize you beat Ron Starr. So tell me uh, that story. Well, Ron Starr was the counselor in, in 1980. And um, what we were concerned about in Applewood Acres was all the street lighting. We we had do you remember the years and years ago, the street lights were just little, little bulbs, you know, they weren't good, you know, and we were very, very concerned about that. You know, Applewood Acres is a big area and um, we wanted better street lighting. And we just, the, the association just never seemed to get any reaction from the counselor. So that was when they, they the association asked me to run. And, and I ran and um, one thing led to another. And I guess my campaign was successful. You know, we had a, a very um, interesting campaign. We had a lot of discussions back and forth, Ron and I, at various uh, uh, meetings at the church meeting and this type of thing. And um, it, it was interesting. And, and I'll never forget one lady standing up in the church. We were doing our, our, uh, our conversations with, and our debates and one lady from the audience stood up and she said, I understand that you're only running because you need the money. And I looked at her. And at that time, I said, you know, madam, I said, my dad just sold his farm in Malton and he just passed away. Do You think I need the money? <laughs> you know, because we had some good money at that time from the sale of the farm. It was expropriated and we took the best offer, you know. And that sort of, uh, everybody just sort of laughed in the room. And I thought, you know, that that might hurt me in getting votes, but it didn't. I, I ended up getting all the votes. During your three terms uh, in the 1980s in Mississauga politics, what was the biggest issue of the time? I think probably at that time, Brian, the city of Mississauga was, was undergoing expansion. And if you look back... Um, Everything north of Burnham Thorpe in the city of Mississauga at that time, uh, we were dealing with what we were going to allow the zoning for the five different areas. And that was probably the biggest issue that we dealt with through the, the, the terms. Um, everything north of, of Burnham Thorpe from the east and west borders of Mississauga was dealt with at that time and all the zoning and all the, the industrial zoning, the residential zoning and the commercial and so forth was all put in place at that time. And um, in fact, um, with all due respect to, to Madam Mayor who has passed away, um, one of the problems we had at that time in 1982 was that um, she, was, she was actually found guilty of a conflict of interest in the zoning. Um, she was charged, went to court, and um, we all had to give testimony. She owned a big farm. Her and Sam, her husband, owned a big farm up in Streetsville. And she actually took part in the zoning discussion of that farm. And we didn't know that at council. She was supposed to, at that time, legally declare her conflict and step away during that discussion, and she didn't. So she ended up being charged by a Streetsville lawyer, went to court and was found guilty. Now the, the comical part of this discussion is that the judge, when she stood to face her, her uh, um, sentence, the judge said, Madam Mayor, he said, I can find you guilty forever and a day and uh, find you guilty and prevent you from holding office forever and a day, or I can find you guilty and suspend you from office for one day. He said, but in light of your age, and obviously you're going to retire soon, I'm going to find you guilty with no punitive action. <laughs> that was 1982. And she served for another, what, 20 years? <clears throat> At least, a, yeah, right till uh, 2018, yeah. I didn't know that. That's hilarious. That's a that's a good story. Uh, in uh, 2018, when you served again, what was the big issue? Good question. Um I, I don't I don't think there was a big issue. We were 
just moving along with the city and, and getting things done. Um, I was concentrating more at that time on, on what my um, predecessor, the, the late Jim Tovey, was uh, concerned with down on, on the lakeshore. And that was where I, I spent a lot of my time um, basically dealing with the the future developments. Um, if you remember, maybe you don't, but there used to be the, the um, um, uh, fuel tanks and, and a gasoline company, an oil company down on the lakeshore. The Sugar that, Road and Lakeshore, yes, for sure. The right. oil lands. That's right. Yeah. 75 I acres. Yeah. And now it's under FRAM development and uh, it's coming along nicely. So I, I wanted to work with the developers to make sure that what counts, the late councillor's concerns might have been were carried through, in which they were. And that's what I spent my time on. That plus the other development down where the old four smokestacks used to be. The Four Sisters, the, Lakeview the Generating four, Station. Right. And 120 course, or 140 acres, I believe. Well, that, that was the site of the original airport in Canada by Alexander Graham Bell, you know. So I worked with the developers on that, and, and uh, that, that's where I spent most of my time, you know. Dave, I've got to ask you, you know, I think that Jim uh, Tovey uh, did a great job of uh, of working with the Lake uh, the, the the Lakeview Residents Association even before he became a councillor and and really yep. envisioning uh, what was going to happen there. Uh, uh, as you may know, I was chairman of the Mississauga City Summit at the time, and uh, I recruited Jim to be uh, one of the 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 chairman of a committee that we had on uh, on on uh, lakefront development, waterfront development, and he did a great job along with. Uh, um, you know, several other people, architects and uh, urban planners uh, from the city of, from the University of uh, Toronto, uh, et cetera. Uh, but one of the biggest concerns I have is the lack of any transportation or transit um, improvements. And I think with, you know, 75 acres at Mississauga Road and uh, Lakeshore, they think, I think it's about 9,000 uh, potential residents living in that area and, and no increase or, you know, improvement of Mississauga Road or Lakeshore Road or or here Ontario Road, frankly, maybe even, uh, you know, some reduction as you put in an LRT down the, the middle of the, the road. I think those roadways are going to be a disaster once that development starts uh, being occupied. And even worse is the 140 acres uh, at Lakeview with, uh, you know, I think it's what, 15 or, or more if this MZO goes through that doubles the density. Yep. Um, and again, no improvements to Cothra, no improvements to Dixie, no improvement to Brown's Line, no improvements to Lakeshore Road. Um, and yes, you've got this uh, here Ontario LRT, but it stops in poor credit. It doesn't go to either of those two big developments. Aren't these developments going to just be a disaster for congestion in South Mississauga? The, the very good point. And in fact, this is the very um, point that was brought up um, to me. And um Unfortunately, I was only there for nine months, but what I was told by the staff was that they're, they're very concerned, and they agree with what you're saying, and they're very concerned with the east-west corridor. Um, what they are talking about is putting, I guess, an LRT along Lakeshore, but they've got a, it's not wide enough, for one thing. Uh, when it hits uh, Mississauga Road, um, crossing the, the, uh, the Credit River is going to be a major problem. So where does it where does it stop, or do they redo the bridge? So all of this is being under under uh, discussion at this point. I don't know what the answer is um, and what they're going to do. Um, the the LRT going up here in Ontario that that was Hazel McCallion's big fight all the time she was in office. Originally, a lot of people don't know this, but originally back when I was elected, one of the concerns was that we wanted to create an LRT that went east and west along Burnham Thorpe that would link, uh, you know, Burlington, Oakville um, to Toronto through Mississauga. So we wanted to, to go through Burnham Thorpe. If you go up in Burnham Thorpe now, just east of here, Ontario, you'll notice that the road is very wide. Like it, it was purposely designed that way so that we could put an LRT in. Hazel kept arguing, opposing that. She wanted to go north and south to Brampton. Final result is Brampton doesn't want it, so it's going to be stopping at Derry Road and, and down at Port Credit. So what's going to happen with the, the east-west uh, movement of traffic is going to be terrible. You know, so I, 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 I really think it's going to be a disaster in South Mississauga, and I think that the, the, the city council is going to take 
is going to have to take responsibility for it. Um, and I do think there are some solutions. One of the solutions that Jim Tovey recommended at one point in time didn't go through, uh, but I thought it was kind of intriguing. Um, and he used uh, downtown Oakville as the example that they were able to keep the flavor of Lakeshore Road in downtown Oakville because they built both south of Lakeshore and north of Lakeshore um, sort of bypasses. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he had mentioned to me at one point in time that Queen Street is called Queen Street to the west of uh, the Loblaws uh, and, uh, you know, right there by the by the Port Credit Legion to the west of uh, the Credit River and then also called Queen Street to the east of the Credit River and, and you know, north of uh, of Mentor College to the east of uh, of uh, here, Ontario. And he said we should join up Queen Street the whole way across. Uh, build a new bridge uh, right beside uh, the the go train bridge between the legion okay. and the arena and uh, and 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 have a bypass so that not all the traffic has to go along lakeshore um and and most of it is actually commercial on both sides not residential mm -hmm. and so it wouldn't actually disturb that many people from a residential standpoint and it could go all the way from i think uh Lauren park to to almost Cothra. what do you think yeah. of that idea did that make any sense it, it does make it does make sense yeah and another thing in, in addition to that um you know with with the uh, fram development and mississauga road and, and that what they they should be looking at too is expanding mississauga road up to the queen elizabeth but it's a heritage street and to take that beautiful two-lane road and make it four lanes i think would be a, just a disaster it would be better for transportation yes. but i think it would destroy the oh it probably would but the heritage but, of that area and to but, do that just to get some more cars to the QEW, you know, I think that would be proof that it was a, it was a, it was a mistake to allow yeah. that development to take place with no improvement in transportation. I, I would have thought the right thing to do is to to loop that to here Ontario LRT, which was considered at one point in time down uh, south of the Port Credit Go to Port Street and then uh, across the Credit River into that development, so that at least people could take transit um, up to the Port Credit Go because a lot of yeah. them were probably going to be wanting to get on the go or go downtown. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. We got to take a break for some messages. I'm going to come back with some concluding comments with uh, Dave Cook, author, historian, politician, uh, news writer in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga Nine Six. We're chatting today with Dave Cook. He's a historian that's written four books about uh, Mississauga, Applewood Acres, uh, Dixie Arena, and two stories, uh, two books on uh, the fading history, both Volume One and Volume Two, that really chronicle the history of uh, of, of Mississauga. Dave uh, has been a uh, a newscaster. He's been a politician. He's a historian. He's an author. Um, Dave, uh, if people want to see your books where can they where can they see them are they in libraries are they online are they uh, available to buy only through me <laughs> i'm self-published and uh in as a self-publisher if you deal with with uh, bookstores you end up losing money i have to pay all the bills to the printer you know so the best way is to get them through me and um um i'm i'm usually at um uh every saturday coming starting in june june 1st I will be down in Port Credit at the farmer's market with a table set up and my books will be up for sale. Awesome. Uh, or you can contact me directly here and I can email you an order form. Uh, um, if, if you want, I can give you my phone number. No, that's okay. But okay. Uh, but people can certainly contact you and I'll, uh, I look forward to maybe getting a signed version from you. First the autographed. Good. Well, our restaurant, we'll have to meet there then. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, Dave, you know, we the big controversy this past year has been the idea of this divorce of Mississauga uh, from uh, from Brampton and the breakup of Peel Region. And, uh, you know, uh, Hazel McCallion at one point in time was for it. Uh, the former uh, mayor of Mississauga was for it. Um, Patrick Brown, the mayor of Brampton, was uh, strongly against it. Um, and uh, and the premier of Ontario initially for it and then uh, uh, rescinded that agreement and uh and I think uh, said that based on a lot of the economic analysis, uh, particularly that uh, Mayor Brown put forward, that it would be, you know, over a billion dollars of cost, supposedly, uh, to the taxpayers of Mississauga and Brampton uh, because of the the sort of the costing efficiencies of breaking Peel Region apart. What do you think of that issue? Should Mississauga and Brampton be separate cities or they sh should they be the way they are under the region of Peel or 
some people I argue they should actually be amalgamated. What's your position, sir? I honestly believe that we should just leave it as it is. Um, in order to break away, you then have to, and the cost factor comes into it, you have to then develop board of health, social services, police, in each of the municipalities. And what what is the cost impact going to be to do that? Um, and what is wrong with leaving the, the Peel region to, to have their health department serving the region, the police department serving the region, and so forth? Um, I, I honestly believe that, that for the last 50 years, we have been very successful with Peel Region and, and the city of Mississauga and the city of Brampton. Uh, why change? So and I, Golden in uh, 1996 did a big GTA task force study that uh, said that having um, a greater Toronto area with uh, the mayor of Toronto uh, and uh, at the time, I think there were 34 different mayors um, of other cities around Toronto made no sense and that there needed to be some uh, rationalization. And she recommended at the time the amalgamation of Toronto, which was implemented and uh, and the the, the metropolitan um yeah. The city of Toronto uh, or Ray, uh, Metropolitan, whatever it's called, Metropolitan Toronto became one city and, and Etobicoke, right. North York, Scarborough, uh, East York and Toronto were all amalgamated into Toronto. But she also recommended the amalgamation of Peel, of Halton, of York and of Durham. And she said that therefore there would be four cities around the city of Toronto and the mayor of Toronto and those five mayors all together would form a new GTA council. I chatted with Hazel McCallion about that once, and she said that uh, that was the right thing to do, and everyone would oppose it just like she opposed the amalgamation of Streetsville into Mississauga. But after a couple of years, everyone would realize it was the right thing to do it. But she said no one's got the political balls to actually make that yeah. recommendation and uh, and implement it because so many people would just dislike the idea of amalgamation, even though it makes a lot of economic sense and political sense. What do you think? Is that a good idea or a dumb idea? Well, it, you know, on paper it looks good, but in reality, when you when here I am as a homeowner every year faced with an increase in my property tax, um, and I'm listen, I'm 82 years old. I don't apart from my books, which I don't make too much money on. Where's my income? And yet every year my taxes go up and up and up, and I'm just petrified that if you make all these changes, why are we making them? Prove to me that it's going to save me money. Uh, and they can't. It's going to cost money. Is it going to be more efficient? I don't think so. It's very efficient the way it is now. So hmm. I don't know. Dave Cook, historian, author, sportscaster, newscaster, news writer, uh, politician, and a uh, man that knows more about Mississauga than anyone I've met other than the former uh, Mayor of uh, Mississauga, Hazel McCallion. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us a little bit about uh, your history and the history of Mississauga. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the effort, the uh, the time spending with you, and I look forward to seeing you at, at our, our our local restaurant. <laughs> and I want uh, I want to buy two of those books from you, sir. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dave Cook, for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on nine sixty AM Saga nine sixty. You can stream me online even from Applewood Acres at www.saga960m.ca. All my podcasts and videos are available on my website, briancrombie.com. My podcasts are available on a whole bunch of podcast servers, and my videos are available on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Good night, everyone. Have a great week.